Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the campus of Northern Illinois University. My name is Matt Streb, and I'm the chair of the political science department here at NIU. We are thrilled that you are joining us for the first of four interesting conversations uh, on the presidential election as part of our presidential election speaker series this year. Tonight, we have two nationally recognized experts who will discuss the controversial Supreme Court ruling in the Citizens United case and talk about the effects that money has had to date so far on both the presidential and, and to maybe a lesser extent the congressional elections. Before introducing our speakers, though, I'd like to recognize uh, a very important person to this university, actually two very important people to this university, our president, uh, Dr. John G. Peters, and, uh, and our first lady, Mrs. Barbara Cole Peters. As many of you know, I think President Peters is a trained political scientist, and so he has uh, a great deal of interest in these topics. He has a lot of opinions on these topics. I I'm not sure how well informed those opinions are, but we'll, we'll wait and see. But I will tell you tonight that he might be concerned about the role of money in elections, but the person who really has an interest in this topic is Mrs. Peters. And so we'll make sure that you get a chance to talk to Brad a little bit later. So I want to thank you very much for coming, and I want to thank the President for his uh, co-sponsorship of this year's speaker series. I'd also like to thank uh, two of our other co-sponsors, NIU's Division of University Relations and WNIJ. As I said, we are fortunate to have with us two of the nation's leading experts on campaign finance law, and I think what will be a lot of fun about tonight is that both of these guys take very different positions uh, on the issues that we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, but I have to tell you that both have been very instrumental on my thinking about campaign finance reform and the role of money in elections. Before I introduce them, uh, let me just explain how the night's going to work today. I've asked our two speakers to each speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, when that's over, uh, we will sit down and we will have a little bit of a discussion together. And then the last half hour or so, you can see that we have a mic here. We'll open it up to question and answers for, uh, from the audience. So if you have a question, uh, by all means, when the time comes, go to the microphone uh, and we'll certainly be happy to call on you. So now let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Bradley Smith. Uh, and Brad is the Josiah H. Blackmore II, Shirley M. Nault, designated professor of law, one of the longest titles I've ever heard, uh, at Capital University. And he's the chairman of the Center for Competitive Politics. In 2000, he was nominated by President Clinton to fill a Republican designated seat on the Federal Election Commission, where he served for five years, including as chairman in 2004. He's written numerous law review articles and books on a variety of issues. Uh, I think the book that he's written that's most pertinent for tonight might be his book, Unfree Speech, The Folly of Campaign Finance Reform, that was published by Princeton University Press. And I need to give just a very quick personal story about Brad. Uh, when I was writing my book, I was in the process of reading Unfree Speech, uh, and I found it very interesting, and it had a, an, an impact on me, and, and, and I was struggling with a lot of the things that Brad was, was talking about, and he challenged a lot of kind of the preconceived notions I had about things. So I had a fair number of questions, and I thought, oh, what the heck, I'm just going to, this guy doesn't know me, but I'm just going to send him an email uh, out of the blue, uh, and, you know, I, I have a bunch of questions, and he'll ignore me, and, you know, I wasted 10 minutes of my life, and, and I'll go on with my day. So I, I sent Brad this email, and I went to lunch. I uh, didn't think much about it. I came back from lunch and I already had an email from Brad and there was about eight paragraphs uh, responding to, uh, to my email. So I think that shows you what kind of uh, a person Brad is. Uh, again, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Brad Smith. Thank you, Matthew, very much. Uh, I appreciate the nice introduction and uh, Thank you, President Peters and Mrs. Peters. Uh, I like the way you introduced them, Matt. It was spoken like a guy with tenure, and uh, <laughs> very nice. Um, okay, I want to start by talking about uh, March of 2009. It was about 10.35 in the morning when Deputy Solicitor General Malcolm Stewart rose to address the United States Supreme Court in a case called Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. Now, the case was, everybody knows it's an important case. They tend not to get to the Supreme Court if they're not important. But I think most people thought it would be decided on relatively narrow grounds. The case had to do with whether under the uh, Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, better known as uh, McCain-Feingold, 
uh, a group called Citizens United, an incorporated nonprofit association, could in fact air uh, through uh, video on demand uh, a movie they'd made, a rather hackneyed political documentary called Hillary the Movie. Uh, and also whether they could air commercials for that ad uh, on television and radio, since those would be broadcast ads within 30 days of a primary election. Um, and uh, this, was, this was the question, could they run these ads? And Stewart, who was a very experienced litigator, had argued several times in the court, had argued uh, campaign finances before in the court, ca campaign finance cases, got up and he begins talking. And he gets just a very short ways through when Justice Sam Alino leans over the podium, and, and here I'm gonna be paraphrasing a bit because so I don't have anything, he says, what's your response to the point that uh, banning or prohibiting the distribution of this movie is really no different than prohibiting the distribution of political messages over the internet or maybe through a, a book or a, a DVD, perhaps in a library? Uh, could the government ban books. And Malcolm Stewart knew that he was in big trouble. And he hemmed and hawed for a little bit. But Alito kept after him and finally Stewart said essentially, yes. The Constitution, the First Amendment of the Constitution allows the United States government to ban the prohibition of books. Now this was a watershed moment because until that time, all the arguments in the Supreme Court had always managed to be focused on the idea that but we're just trying to control corruption, we're not really limiting speech, we're not really limiting people's ability to make a message. But in fact, this finally laid bare the government's position. And many people afterwards said, why, why would he say that? Oh my gosh, it killed us. He said that because that was his client's position. His client believed that the Constitution of the United States gave it the power to ban books and movies. And there was this kind of brief pause in the Supreme Court chambers. And then Alito said, that's pretty incredible. And the bench sprang to life. And before poor, poor Malcolm Stewart was able to sit down, he had told Justice Kennedy that the government could ban, under the current law, under the statute at issue, the distribution of books and movies or uh, by Kindle or Nook, devices like that. He had told uh, Justice Souter that the government could prohibit a union from publishing a pamphlet, a political pamphlet, something like, uh, you know, why working people should support Obama's reelection or something like that. And he had told Chief Justice John Roberts that the government could prohibit the publication of a 500-page book that contained even one sentence advocating the election or defeat of a candidate. Now, when we look at that case, and when we look at the government's position, I think it's very, very hard to argue that Citizens United was not correctly decided. One of the things that interests me, reporters would call up all the time in the days before the opinion came out. They'd always ask me, is this gonna be 5-4, it's gonna be 5-4. I'd say, no, it's not going to be 5-4. It's going to be 9 nothing, maybe 8-1, to one, right? Maybe Stevens. There'll be different opinions on the rationale, but no member of the court, except maybe Stevens, is actually going to say that the government can ban the distribution of this movie. And I was wrong. There are radicals on the Supreme Court. There are four members of the Supreme Court who say, yes, the government can ban the distribution of a book or a movie if it involves a corporation. So if you've got a book that's been published by, say, McGraw-Hill or sold through, say, Barnes & Noble, the government can ban that if it has political advocacy in it. If you've got a movie produced by, say, DreamWorks or showing at AMC theaters, which are both corporations, the government can ban that. And the court set the case for re-argument, saying, okay, we better check this out, you know, and it was re-argued. The second time it was argued, uh, now Justice Kagan, at the time Solicitor General Kagan, argued the case herself, and she made the point that the, the government really wouldn't ban books. You know, it wouldn't, wouldn't really do that. She said, in fact, that it never had, which wasn't quite true. The FEC had spent a couple years investigating a book written by George Soros and whether that book constituted an illegal campaign contribution. Um, then they asked her, well, what about pamphlets? Would you prohibit the distribution of pamphlets? She said, well, yeah, pamphlets would be a different thing. We would ban the distribution of pamphlets. Uh, 
So you have to ask yourself, you may have seen, I, I meant to bring one with me and I, I forgot. Those little pocket constitutions, they come out about 50 pages. Is that a pamphlet or a book? Thomas Paine's The Crisis. You know, these are the time that try men's souls. The Sunshine Patriot and all that stuff, right? 63 pages. Is that a pamphlet or a book? Pamphlet that can be banned or a book that cannot? Take a nice essay by Professor Streb here. We put it into a book of essays. It's okay. We publish it on its own. It's a pamphlet that can be prohibited, apparently. In any case, let's, this is the decision. And I think you need to understand what this decision is about. Now, let's, I'm going to come back to the decision, but let's first talk about what the decision is not about. I want to make a couple of quick points. There are two things that are popular in, or that have caught the eye, the popular imagination. I think I'm mixing some metaphors there, but that are not what this case is about. One is the idea that money is speech. Some people are like, well, money isn't speech. You know, this is absurd. Money is money. Speech is speech. The Supreme Court does not say money is speech. The Supreme Court does recognize that limiting expenditures of money can limit speech, that limiting spending can limit your other constitutional rights. Okay? So, for example, if the government said, well, you're free to practice any religion you want, you can believe anything you want, you can even talk about it to whomever you want. You just can't spend any money to build churches, buy hymnals, pay pastors, engage in charity work for your church or maybe even travel to and from church. Would that affect your freedom of religion? I think it would. If the government said, well, you're free to own weapons. You can have a gun. You just can't spend any money to buy a gun or ammunition. Would that affect the Second Amendment? Yes, it would. Okay, we can disagree about what the Second Amendment covers, but I don't think anybody can disagree that that would not affect the Second Amendment. And if the government said, well, you can only spend say $117,500 a year to publish a newspaper, which is the maximum amount that anybody can spend on politics under the Federal Election Campaign Act on contributions. If we said you can only spend $117,500 to publish a newspaper, you would very quickly have either no newspaper at all or a very thin, very irregularly published newspaper. And if this university could not pay to bring speakers here, we wouldn't all be here tonight. Okay? So you understand that limiting money uh, does in fact limit speech. And this is not controversial. All nine members of the Supreme Court agree with this. In the last 60 years, there have been 29 justices that have sat on the court to hear uh, First Amendment uh, campaign finance cases. 27 of the 29 agree with that. The two who don't, White and Stevens, uh, both did believe that spending money was entitled to some constitutional property or protection, uh, just they would have put it under the property clauses rather than the First Amendment. Um, the second issue that the case is not about is whether corporations are people. All right, corporations are not people and nobody thinks they are people. I've never met a person in my life who thinks a corporation is a person. What corporations are is associations of persons. And I like a baseball team. That's an association of people. Okay? And the Supreme Court recognizes that and has recognized that. And this is a doctrine that goes deep into common law history. This is not controversial. The idea of corporate personhood is normal. All nine members of the Supreme Court believe that corporations are treated as legal persons, right, for certain purposes. Corporations do not have all the rights of individuals. They have the rights that individuals can exercise in association with others. So a corporation cannot run for office, just like you and I can't get together and run for office and we say, well, I'll be the governor on you know, weekdays and you'll be the governor on weekends and during the summer, okay? You don't do that. Corporations can't vote because you and I don't go in and vote together. We vote as individuals. But anything we can do as a group, corporations basically can do, okay? So corporations can own property and corporations can speak. I can go downtown and speak. You can go downtown and speak. If the two of us get together and call ourselves an Occupy movement or a Tea Party, we don't lose our right to speak. And if we decide after a while that, gee, you know, maybe we should have some organization to handle our affairs and our bank accounts, and we incorporate to do that, we still don't lose our right to speak. I always laughed during the Occupy movement, they begin to get money in from labor unions and others, and some people said, well, I remember seeing an interview with the guy, and he's like, oh, we, we got to figure out a way to manage this stuff. We're getting all this money in, and we, can't, we don't have a way to handle the bank accounts and stuff. The legal system provides a way to do that. It's called a corporation. 
So that's what you form. And virtually every nonprofit that you deal with, virtually every for-profit that you deal with are corporations. These are associations of people pursuing common goals, sometimes economic, sometimes political, sometimes fraternal, sometimes charitable. Okay, we don't lose our rights. This is, again, if you want to disagree with this, you can do it, but you need to understand this is not a controversial notion within uh, the field of law, and all nine justices of the Supreme Court agree with the idea of corporate personhood, which has appeared in case after case, early dozens of cases since the, 19th, since the early 19th century. So what, does, what is the issue in this case then? The issue in this case is when can the government override the First Amendment rights of people? and either limit or prohibit speech indirectly through limiting the money that is spent on that speech. That's the issue that faces us, and that's the issue that needs to be joined here. Now, it's an important issue, and there's no doubt that money in politics has certain things that uh, can, can put us ill at ease a little bit, right? It can have that effect. We worry about corruption in politics, and we worry about the lack of equality in politics, okay? But in fact, when we really begin to look at the way money works in politics, we find that neither of these are particularly terrible. Remember, for most of our nation's history, we didn't have laws that extensively governed the use of money in politics. And even when we passed the first laws, the very first laws around 1907 was the first federal statute, they were so unenforceable and unenforced that effectively up until the 1970s, we really didn't regulate this. This is a new phenomenon, the idea that we have to regulate money in American politics. And we might begin to ask ourselves, how has it worked? After 40 years, do we think we get better campaigns? Do we think we bet, get better governance? Is this really been such a great deal? With that in mind, we might think of a basic point that relates to Citizens United. Prior to Citizens United, 26 states, that's a majority of the states, right, representing a majority of the U.S. population, allowed unlimited corporate spending in state races, governor, secretary of state, judges if they elect judges, the state legislature, and so on, right? But you couldn't tell me which states those were. You wouldn't be able, I think, to go around and say, oh, yeah, we can tell this one's well-governed, this one's poorly governed, or anything like that. In fact, the Pew Charitable Trust does one rating. There's many ratings, and these ratings are intended to serve other purposes. I just want to point out that you can't draw the, even the correlation, let alone the cause and effect. Pew Charitable Trust does a rating of the best-governed states. Right? They use a bunch of non-partial criteria. In other words, not policy-based criteria, but rather criteria like is the state simply well run? Does it get a good bang for its buck? Is it efficient? Is it transparent in its government? So on, right? The six best governed states in Pew's last survey are all states that allowed unlimited corporate spending in elections. Right? The top six. And this is not uncommon. I remember I testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee about a year ago, and Pat Leahy is the chairman of that committee, Senator from Vermont. And Senator Leahy began with his opening remarks by talking about how in Vermont, a very small state, which is where he represents, uh, even small amounts of corporate spending could just dominate the entire state. And I thought to myself, I'm sitting there thinking, Pat, Vermont is one of the oldest states in the country. It's like 14 or 15, you know? It's one of the very first ones right, after the original 13. Vermont has never prohibited corporate spending in elections. Pat Leahy was elected attorney general of Vermont and all this kind of stuff. Vermont, here it is, one of the most left-wing states in the country. They just let those corporations spend. And all of a sudden, Citizens United is handed down, and suddenly members of the legislature go, oh my god, we need to react. We can't have corporations spending in our elections. And I'm like, Corporations have spent in your elections for 200 friggin' years. Shut up. Okay. That's the kind of problem that we have, I think, in debating this issue sometimes seriously. In fact, if we think about it, all the fears of all this spending aren't coming true. Oh, there's a lot of money being spent, and you can read stories, and you hear lots of stories. People like to say, it's secret money, you know, and they like to focus on those things. But, but let's Let's work past the sort of lingo and the rhetoric, the images, right? And let's look at this campaign. Is this campaign so bad compared to past campaigns? Is it really 
worse than, you know, people say, well, they're too negative. Well, they're always negative. This is worse than Swift Boat Veterans for Truth or, you know, the NAACP running an ad in 2000 that reenacted the dragging death of a man named James Byrd. He was dragged to death behind a pickup. And the NAACP put that in an ad and said, if George Bush had passed hate crimes legislation, this wouldn't have happened. Those are pretty negative ads, Swift Boat Vets and stuff like that, right? Um, it's a competitive election, to be sure. Turnout's going to be high. 2010, the first election after Citizens United, turnout was high. It was a very issue-oriented campaign for the House, one of the most issue-oriented ones we've seen. And repeatedly, the new deregulated system actually tended to be an equalizer in campaigns. So you had people like uh, Dan Maffei. He was a congressman from upstate New York. He lost his race by like 1,000 votes. And a, a group went in there and spent about $500,000 in independent spending. And Maffei was like, oh, I lost because these people came into the race. It's so terrible for democracy because one thing every member of Congress agrees on is his defeat is terrible for democracy. And Maffei is complaining and whining about how bad this was and how unfair it was. But you know what? Even including the super PAC spending, Dan Maffei outspent his opponent by over a million dollars. Now that seemed perfectly fair to Dan Maffei. No problem with that. What's unfair is that he didn't get to outspend his opponent by $1,500,000, apparently. That would have been a more fair election. And, you know, we see this, I could give you example after example, where Citizens United has, in fact, leveled the playing field in that way. In some races, it'll make it less equal. In other races, it will make it more equal. We also see, of course, that big corporations aren't terribly interested in participating in elections, big publicly traded corporations. You know, we're always told us, Halliburton and Exxon are going to take over. Are they taking over, Halliburton and Exxon? Are they making any campaign expenditures? I mean, maybe they're taking over, but they're not doing it because they're making campaign expenditures. Big corporations don't make campaign expenditures. Why? Because they have customers. Years ago, Michael Jordan was asked why he wasn't supporting a Senate candidate in North Carolina who was challenging Jesse Helms, and Jordan responded, because Republicans buy shoes too. Okay? And that's how most big corporations tend to treat their business. They're not interested in doing this. Corporations are contributing very little money. The real story has actually been more larger individual corporations. And are these spend courts expenditures drowning people out? No, they're making more voices heard. Tell Newt Gingrich's supporters that his, they were drowned out in the primaries by Sheldon Adelson's spending. Tell Rick Santorum's spenders that they were drowned out in the primary by Foster Freeze's spending on a super PAC. Of course, this isn't corporation, but it shows that the, the newly liberalized system, in fact, can make voices heard. Ross Perot made people heard in the 1990s. Historically, large contributions are especially valuable to candidates who are not who don't begin, I should say, with a great deal of popularity. People who have new ideas, people who are challengers. Because by definition, they're not that popular. If you're going to challenge Coke, the big name incumbent, you need big money behind you, right? You've got to come in. Otherwise, nobody's going to hear of your little pop venture, your little soda pop venture. And so, in fact, we found that challengers and outsiders have always relied it more on this kind of spending. Well, as my time rolls to an end, I'm probably already past, let me just suggest in this, in this tight world then that we need to look at how money actually works in politics. And we need to think seriously about whether we really want to give the government the power to decide who can speak and how much they can speak and when they can speak. And we should recognize that that is a very dangerous power to give government. Indeed, I would say it is exactly why we have a First Amendment, to prevent the government from deciding that these speakers, Today it might be corporations, tomorrow it might be something else, have too much influence in our politics and therefore should not be allowed to speak. And I'm going to close with a quick quote uh, from a Supreme Court justice here. As he noted, the people have the final say. The people determine through their votes the destiny of the nation. It is therefore important, vitally important, that all channels of communication be open to them during every election that no point of view be restrained or barred, and that the people have access to the views of every group in the community. The most complete exercise of these rights is essential to the full, fair, and uh, untrammeled operation of the electoral process. No, that was not some right-winger like Kennedy or Scalia. That was 
Justice William O. Douglas arguing back in the 1950s in a case which the Supreme Court dismissed on sort of procedural grounds, remanded back to the lower court when Douglas thought they should have faced that uh, constitutional issue head on right there. And that's really the liberal tradition in free speech in America. And it's one that I would hope that we would rally around rather than giving the government the ability to tell you when you've spoken enough. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brad. Our uh, next, speecher, uh, next speaker is Richard Hassan. Uh, Rick is Chancellor's Professor of Law in Political Science at the University of California, Irvine. He's the founding co-editor of Election Law Journal, uh, a journal that I was fortunate enough to publish in, so I want to thank you for helping me get tenure so I can make fun of President Peters. Um, and he often ri he writes the often quoted election law blog. If you are interested in election law, uh, this is a must read. You're interested in elections, this is a must read uh, for you. And if you join the listserv, you can oftentimes see Rick and Brad going back and forth debating each other uh, on that blog. Uh, Rick, too, has written numerous law review articles and books. His most recent book is The Voting Wars from Florida 2000 to the Next Election Meltdown, published by Yale University Press. Uh, and he's actually been out uh, traveling around the country on a book tour uh, about that, that, that very book. He was on Rachel Maddow uh, just the other day. But he's happy here to talk about something a little bit different. And you'll see he takes a very different position uh, than Brad does in Citizens United. So Rick Hassan, welcome. Thank you, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to uh, be talking about something other than my book after having given my uh, book talk four times in three days. So this is a nice uh, change of pace and uh, uh, very uh, good to be back with Matt. Matt and I were colleagues uh, at uh, Loyola in Los Angeles and uh, great to uh, see him again. Uh, so uh, I, I wanna talk about three things uh, in my uh, introductory remarks. First, Citizens United jur as jurisprudence, how did the court deal with uh, the issues in that case? Uh, second, how might Citizens United be affecting our elections? And third, how might uh, Citizens United affect policy? So those are the three points I want to hit on. Uh, you'll see there are some things that um, uh, Brad and I do agree on and some things where uh, we have some disagreements. So first, focusing on the question of jurisprudence. And I want to back up to 1976 and just give a little context. Uh, uh, the, the main Supreme Court case determining how to balance First Amendment rights First Amendment rights of free speech and association against government interests, like the government's interest in preventing corruption from large amounts of money, stems from this 1976 case, Buckley versus Vallejo. That was a case where the Supreme Court split the baby. It said that contribution limits, limits on how much you give to a candidate, could in fact be limited under the First Amendment. But that independent spending, as applied to individuals, an individual wants to spend money to put an ad, say, in a newspaper to support or oppose a candidate, those could not be limited under the First Amendment. Now, why the difference? Well, the court said a few things. The first thing the court said was that contribution limits uh, implicate lesser interest. When you contribute money, it's less of a First Amendment act than when you spend money directly. The most important thing about a contribution, the court said, was the act of contributing, not the amount of the contribution. Uh, with spending, though, it was a direct limitation on speech. In addition, the court said that uh, contributions were especially dangerous in terms of uh, when they were large because of the danger that they could corrupt candidates, create a quid pro quo or something like that, something akin to bribery, or at least create the appearance in the public's mind that elections are being bought and sold. And the court said, at least in this case, there wasn't evidence that independent spending could do that. And so since the 1976 opinion, we've been dealing with the Supreme Court's changing views about campaign finance, all within the lens of this uh, Buckley case. In Buckley, the court didn't address the question whether corporations and unions could be limited in their spending. What federal law said was that if you were a corporation uh, or a labor union, you couldn't take money out of your general treasury fund. So if you were a company that sells shoes, you couldn't take your money from the sale of shoes and use it on political speech. Instead, you could set up a special fund, you could pay all of its expenses, 
called a political action committee or a PAC, and you could solicit your shareholders and your executives to give money into that. Uh, since 1910, I believe it was, uh, we've had limitations on corporate contributions, and since the 1940s, limitations on corporate and union spending in elections, no spending in federal elections. The court didn't address the question in Buckley. In a case called Bellotti, a few years later, the court said, when it comes to ballot measures in states that have initiatives or those kinds of processes, you can't bar corporations from spending money there because there's no candidate to corrupt. And the other thing the court did in Buckley was the court said that the idea that you could level the playing field, achieve some kind of equality, uh, and that would be a reason in which, and when I talk to reformers, people who don't like uh, the campaign finance rules, they're often concerned about equality. The court rejected equality as an interest and said that was wholly foreign to the First Amendment, that you couldn't have that kind of balancing. But again, in Buckley, the court didn't address the corporate question. The court did address that question in a 1990 case called Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce. Michigan had a system like the federal system. Corporations could spend money on elections, they just had to do it through a PAC. And the Supreme Court, on a six to three vote, upheld that regulation, and it distinguished Buckley. It said, the reason that you could limit corporate spending was because of what the court called a different type of corruption. And here's how it described the corruption. Preventing the corrosive and distortive effects of immense aggregations of wealth that are accumulated with the help of the corporate form and that have little or no correlation to the public's support for the corporation's political ideas. Very powerful words there, in very much in tension with what the court said in Buckley, versus, uh, Buckley and Bellotti, those two earlier cases. The court called this a different type of corruption. I think of it like the other white meat. It's not really corruption. This looks like an equality concern, but the court didn't call it equality. The court called it corruption so that there would be, at least on the appearance, a little bit less tension. But the court upheld, the important point is the court upheld the corporate limit. In Citizens United, the court struck down Austin, struck down other cases relying on Austin, and uh, as Brad uh, told us about the facts, it involved a corporation, it was a nonprofit corporation, which already could have spent its general treasury funds on uh, putting uh, this um, documentary on TV through uh, video on demand. It could have spent its money, but it took for-profit corporate money. So nonprofits were already allowed to spend their money uh, in uh, elections generally, but not if they took for-profit money. So why did this group take for-profit money? Precisely to challenge the law. This was a test case. So they took the for-profit money and uh, they uh, uh, wanted to spend this money on video on demand. The Supreme Court could have ducked the big issue about whether to overrule Austin. Instead, they reached out and, are, uh, and, and asked the parties to brief the question of whether Austin should be overruled. It was very unusual. The court reached out and decided an issue it didn't have to. You remember Chief Justice Roberts, when he had his confirmation hearings, he said, I'm going to be modest, I'm going to be an umpire, I'm going to call balls and strikes. But here, the court reached out and asked the parties, hey, should we overrule Austin? versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce, something they did not need to do. The court could have avoided the question, but instead the court did not. The court said this PAC idea, not good enough. Corporations have a right to spend unlimited sums on elections. The Austin rationale, which the court described as an equality rationale, finally, was rejected. And the, what, the court said, well, what's the basis for this? The court said independent spending can never corrupt. It can't give rise to corruption or the appearance of corruption. No amount of evidence that anybody could come forward with would be enough to convince the court that independent spending could ever corrupt. Someone wants to spend $100 million, as Sheldon Adelson says he wants to do to get uh, Mitt Romney elected. No potential for corruption and no, no potential that that could create in your minds the appearance of corruption. $100 million spent to try and uh, now, part of this is the court narrowed the definition of corruption so that ingratiation and special access, which you get from spending money, that doesn't even count as corruption. The court said the identity of the speaker doesn't matter. It's all about what people deserve to hear. Very lofty ideas. But then just this year, the Supreme Court unanimously affirmed, without even hearing argument, a case called Blumen versus Federal Election Commission, a case in which the court agreed that a total ban, no PAC limitation, a total ban on foreign spending in US elections is consistent with the First Amendment. There was, a, I think, a doctor, a Canadian doctor and an Israeli lawyer, if I'm remembering the facts right, living in New York. They were not permanent residents of the United States. They wanted to spend money in elections. And they said, we should have a First Amendment right to do that too. Remember, the identity of the speaker doesn't matter. Independent spending can't corrupt. And the Supreme Court said, no, 
So apparently sometimes the identity of the speaker does matter. And if you think about why foreign spending in elections is a problem, we might see why maybe corporate spending in elections is also a problem. And even before Citizens United, the Supreme Court said that a judicial candidate in West Virginia who became the state uh, chief justice had to recuse himself from deciding a case where he was helped to election by three million dollars spent by one of the litigants before him in the case. The court said it violates due process. Why? I'd say it's because of corruption or the appearance of corruption. So the court itself has not been consistent in its treatment of these issues. So we have now the situation where corporations can spend unlimited sums in elections. And thanks to some subsequent developments, they can contribute money not to candidates, but to outside groups to uh, uh, spend to try and influence the outcome of elections. And so we've seen the birth of super PACs. I'm sure you've heard the term super PACs. Super PACs are these groups. They take unlimited sums from individuals, corporations, unions, and spend it independently. Well, not really independently, because what counts as coordination under the Federal Election Commission rules is all kinds of things you can do, including the, the idea that you, if you're the candidate, Mitt Romney or Barack Obama, you could actually ask people to give money to these uh, groups, as long as you don't ask them to give more than $5,000. Now, in addition to this development, there are some other troubling developments this election, not directly tied to Citizens United, but very troubling. Forget the super PACs, they're yesterday's news. Now we see the emergence of these new groups, 501c4s, and the continuation of trade groups like the Chamber of Commerce, 501c6s, that take contributions, just like super PACs, spend money on elections, but because they argue they're not political committees and they don't need to register with the FEC, they take secret money. So we don't know who is contributing. Brad said Exxon and, I uh, forget the other example, uh, Walmart or whatever it was, they're not giving to, super, they're not giving, uh, to uh, these campaigns. Well, they're not giving to super PACs very much, but we know at least that Aetna gave about $2 million in the 2010 uh, election cycle to uh, 501c4s and c6s because they accidentally revealed that in some state filings. We don't know because the money is not as secret and is not revealed. We also saw the end of the public financing system for our presidential campaigns. Uh, so we're seeing a big change and how is it changing things? So here's a chart from the Center for Responsive Politics. I commend this site to you, opensecrets.org. This shows you how much outside money there was as of September 7th, which is when I pulled these slides out of the election year, outside spending. So you can see the figures. In 2008, the total amount of outside spending was uh, by, by this September 7th was 114 million, and now it's 322 million. Something's changed this election. And C4s, those groups that don't disclose their donors, you can see what's happened uh, on this chart as to how much of the money is coming from these groups going into uh, money on uh, election ads. And this is a chart that shows you no disclosure. So you see the rise of what percentage of the outside money in our elections is not disclosed. So in 2010, it was over 40%. We don't know what the figure is going to be uh, in this coming election. So we're seeing no limits, no disclosure. Justice Kennedy in Citizens United said, hey, we've never had this great world where you have unlimited corporate contributions and instant disclosure over the internet. Well, we've got half of that. We've got the unlimited spending, but no instant disclosure. In fact, very little disclosure, at least among these C4s and other type groups. And we know that super PACs played a major role in the Republican primary. So if you look at this chart, uh, the dark figure is the candidate's um, uh, spending, and the light figure on the top of that chart represents the super PAC spending. And you can see, if you look at Gingrich, who's the second one over, about half of his spending came from Sheldon Nadelson and his family. There it is, and that's what kept Gingrich in the race for that long. So already, the super PAC spending is having uh, effects in the election. It may not be determinative, but certainly affecting the election. You see the percentages. Uh, now this is, I think, this chart may be a little hard to see, but this shows super PAC spending so far. Uh, Barack Obama, how much super PAC spending? $22 million supporting him so far outside money, $109 million opposing him. Mitt Romney, 21 million supporting him, 36 million opposing. So that's like 130 million helping Romney versus 58 million 
uh, for Obama. And uh, the yellow on the bottom shows you the pro-Romney spending, and the, uh, the lighter line, again, it's very hard to see, much lower, represents the uh, pro-Obama uh, spending. So what does this all mean? Well, it's not clear if we're going to see more money overall, a shift from parties to candidates to these super PACs and these groups. It's also not clear if we're going to continue to see, although right now it looks likely that we're going to see, that this money is skewing towards the corporate Republican side rather than union and Democratic money. But certainly the super PAC money so far is skewing Republican. And it's also not clear if this money is going to affect the presidential election. I think the bigger danger in terms of this outside spending is in terms of the Senate and the House. We're very close in terms of whether the Senate is going to be Democratic or Republican. Throwing $15 million at the presidential election is actually not all that significant in a national election. Throwing $15 million in a Senate election is quite significant, and we're seeing a lot of spending there. Uh, and uh, House races as well, uh, the spending could be very important. Now finally, how is Citizens United going to affect policy? So I was talking about whether it affects the election. This is actually where my greatest concern is. If you are a candidate or an elected official and you're deciding how you're going to vote and what your policies are going to be, you know that if you don't toe the line of what one of your opponents who's got a lot of money wants, you know, you're on the wrong side of a Sheldon Adelson issue, you've basically got two choices. One choice is you change your policy, change what you do, so that you don't incur the spending against you. Or the other thing is you start raising money like crazy from people who support you and money doesn't come for free. People are expecting something in return. Either way, public policy is being skewed by this money. Now, the First Amendment requires that there be uh, freedom of speech, but freedom of speech is a term that the Supreme Court has said has uh, some limits and has to be balanced against other interests. Justice Breyer has said when it comes to elections, there are First Amendment interests on both sides of the equation. And having one side have so much more of an ability to get a message out than another can skew debate, and as I argue here, it can also skew legislative outcomes. The direct effect is that, that uh, we have these elected officials catering to those who are the big spenders, and the indirect effect is that uh, they're going to cater to those who are on the other side who are going to help them. And uh, it's sometimes said that the Constitution is not a suicide pact. And what I think uh, in this context that means is that we should not have an election system where disparities in economic power, which are necessary for our capitalist system to run, translate into great disparities of economic power. This kind of skew raises concerns both of corruption, of public policy going in the wrong direction because of money, which I would define as corruption, and of inequality. And so I think a big part of my beef is not with Citizens United, but going back to Buckley and this idea that independent spending can't corrupt. The court already said that in Buckley, but said based on the evidence that we have, there's no, uh, uh, there's no evidence of corruption. By the time we got to Citizens United, the Supreme Court said, you can never present enough evidence of corruption to justify a spending limit. I'd like us to take another look at that. The court had an opportunity at the end of last term to look at a case out of Montana. The Montana Supreme Court said, if you look at the history of corporate uh, rule in Montana, we do worry about corruption. And we think that is enough to justify our limitations. And the Supreme Court, on a five to four vote, uh, rejected that. It didn't take the Montana case, uh, or didn't, uh, didn't agree with Montana's argument, reversed the Montana court, without a hearing and said, again on a five to four vote, that you cannot limit corporate spending in, in elections. And by limiting corporate spending, I don't mean corporations can't get their ideas out. Of course, individuals who are associated with the corporation can spend money on elections under the way the rules work. And you could have PACs, which could also do this as well. The lack of disclosure raises especially difficult questions. You know, uh, Karl Rove in 2010 started a super PAC called American Crossroads, and he was raising a lot of money for uh, Republican candidates. And it was not being all that successful until he opened up a sister group called Crossroads GPS. That's the 501c4. And in many quarters, the, the GPS group has spent more or raised more than the super PAC. 
So when people are given the choice for anonymity, many, uh, and, many and I think that there's uh, likely corporate money going in here, but we don't know because no one's going to tell us, uh, people are choosing not to have anonymity. No accountability, so we can't call someone for what they're doing. And I think that's very, uh, very troubling. And even at the FEC, the parties are dividing over some very basic disclosure rules. So we're going to have an election now with the most uh, hidden money uh, in at least a generation. And what effect is that going to have? We're not even going to see all of the effect because a big part of that effect ends up in what Congress does and doesn't do because of how this money is skewing our process. So the implications for our democracy, I think, are troubling. With the greater potential for corruption, more political inequality, which is stemming from economic inequality, and this kind of skew. And what can we do about it? Not very much. The chances of a Citizens United uh, constitutional amendment, I don't think I'm going to see that in my lifetime. It's very difficult to get a constitutional amendment. Uh, we can't even get FEC commissioners confirmed through the Senate. We're not going to get a constitutional amendment. The best way to change the Constitution is to wait for a justice in the five, one of the five justices of the Supreme Court to retire and replace that justice with someone who will vote differently. That's how we change our Constitution in this country these days. It all depends on what Justice Kennedy or whoever replaces him had for breakfast. And that, that's, that's the state of our, our, our campaign finance uh, at this point. We are, there, there are very, certainly Congress could require better disclosure, but in terms of limiting money uh, in elections, creating a more even playing field, minimizing the risk of corruption, we're at a very uh, troubling point, and uh, uh, it may take uh, more than just another Watergate-type scandal to move us to, uh, to a better place. Thanks. Well, as I said, first of all, I want to thank Brad and, and Rick, both, both of you, for your comments. Uh, I would like to ask just a couple questions to you, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, if, if, when the time comes, if you have any questions, please uh, go to the, the microphone. And Brad, I want to start with you very quickly, and it's something that Rick hit on at the end. Um, what's wrong with disclosure laws, right? I mean, do, do this, do this, I mean, I could make an argument, and I think you would agree, that Money is a good thing in elections, and I know you would, you would agree that we should eliminate any individual contribution limit to a candidate and things like that. Um, and I might say I agree with you on that, but what's wrong with, with having the transparency of knowing who's giving money to whom? Uh, and you know, that might actually, couldn't that act as a, an important cue in terms of how people are voting in elections? If you know that Sheldon Adelson's giving this much money to a candidate and you learn something about Sheldon Adelson, that, that could be a, a very, very valuable cue for you. Well, it, it can be a, a valuable cue, and I'm not opposed to all disclosure. Uh, I'm opposed to, you know, excessive disclosure. Mm -hmm. I think first we need to realize what we're talking about when we say disclosure. We sometimes say, well, this money, you know, we don't know who's behind it. Well, every ad tells you who's behind it, okay? Sometimes it doesn't tell us enough, or at least not enough for some people. Every ad says who funds it. Watch them. <clears throat> you won't see an ad print. Media, broadcast, radio, whatever, you will not see an ad that does not tell you who's paying for the ad. And if the ad says paid for by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, you go, okay, I pretty much know the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's agenda, that queuing function. Now, it may be that you don't know the particular companies that are funding it. You know, it's, by the way, the Chamber of Commerce may not know either, other than the extent that it's their members. Um, they don't sort the money out that way. You know, you have to ask yourself, what more do you think you're going to learn? We might see an ad, however, that comes from a group called, you know, uh, Citizens for, you know, Better Stuff. And then you might say, well, boy, I don't know much about that group. I don't know quite what to make of that story that they're telling. But even there, you know, we almost always find out about these groups in very little time. I always laugh in 2010 how many news stories I would read that would say Crossroads GPS a secretive group founded by Karl Rove and former Republican National Committee Chairman Ed Gillespie to promote a conservative pro-business agenda. And I'd be like, well, this is a really crummy secretive group. I mean, you just told me who's running the group, what their agenda is. You know, I have a pretty good idea of what it's all about. 
So I think we need to begin by, by putting the disclosure issue into some perspective. When people throw this out about, oh, secret money, you know, that's an issue. Secondly, we need to put in perspective, it's nice to have charts that show how much secret money is going up or money that's undisclosed. But remember that that is a fraction of the total spending. Even if we attribute all the money that we don't know and say, oh, it's secret and it's corporate, it's going to be a, a minority of the spending on this election, and most of the spending on this election will come from individuals. So we need to keep that in perspective, too. The fact that it's gone up a lot in recent years may not be that important to us. We also need to recognize that it's not new. 501c4s have long spent money on politics without revealing their donors. In the past, the, the big difference for a C4 was in the past, it couldn't say, vote for Mitt Romney. It had to say, Mitt Romney's a great guy. That's it. It couldn't say, vote against Mitt Romney. It had to say, Mitt Romney's a scum That's all, and that was undisclosed. And we had those ads in every election, funded by the NAACP, by the Sierra Club, by the Chamber of Commerce, by Planned Parenthood, by the Rifle Association. We had so, and, and we weren't all freaked out about it, so to speak. I mean, a lot of people were concerned, and we did pass a law in 2000 that required some more disclosure for some types of groups. But for the most part, prior to, to, to 2010, I don't. Th I'll bet very few of you were sitting around going. This disclosure or non-disclosure by these C4 groups of their members is very troubling, right? You weren't thinking that. It wasn't even on your mind. Then we get Citizens United and suddenly people want a, an excuse to attack Citizens United because they don't like the idea of corporations speaking because they think corporations will say things they disagree with, which is the whole reason why we have a First Amendment so that people can't silence them, those they disagree with. And so they try to think, what's a point I can make? Well, the point I can make is not going to be to say the government thought you should be able to ban movies and books. That's not going to sell. The point I can make is it's secret money, and there's too much of it, and who knows who's behind it. That I, and foreign money, right? And that I can sell. The, the other problem with it then is why did C4s, why do C4s not have to disclose their, who their donors are? Because historically, C4s don't even know who's paying for the ad. They do all kinds of things. Political activity is a minority of what they do, and they get money from all sorts of people, and they can't even sort out which dollars went for what ad, right? They don't do it that way. Now, we go back to the 1950s, and there's a number of cases involving mainly the NAACP and mainly other civil rights groups, but also other groups. There's quite a lot of precedent in this area. Um, that says you cannot force these organizations to reveal their donors. And the lead case, NAACP versus Alabama, 1957 case, should tell you all you need to know. In 1957, the NAACP in the state of Alabama did not want to reveal its donors publicly. And you can envision why. Those donors would be subjected to harassment, uh, and the organization would be subjected to harassment. And we may say now, well, we're not talking about the NAACP, we're talking about Karl Rove. Fine. But somewhere you've got to figure out a way to draw a line between those two, right, that preserves that right. We may be in a position, suppose we throw that line away. We say, oh, yeah, you know, that's a hard-run constitutional right. We toss it away now. And three years from now, we have a bunch of bombings at uh, uh, abortion clinics or something like that. And now we're telling groups that would fight to preserve the right to choose that are pro uh, choice on the issue, we're telling them, well, you know, if you run any ads, you've got to tell everybody who your donors are. And those donors have been getting killed, literally. Is that a totally unbelievable scenario? And then we're going to be really maybe upset that we chose to just toss this right so cavalierly out the door. The final point I just make on disclosure, this doesn't really go, I think, to the question most are thinking about, but we also need to be careful. Right now, the disclosure limits, and this is a point I think Rick and I agree on, are, are way too low. Some states, they're as low as $10. Federally, it's $200. They never get adjusted for inflation. We don't really need to know every $200 contributor. You know, there are sites on the web that, where you make that contribution. It's a public database. Anybody can see it. The government keeps this as a public database of your political activity. Anybody can see it. And some sites even automatically hook it up to a map to your house. And, and that's just a little creepy. And I think at a minimum, we could agree that those small donors don't need to be disclosed. And we really should focus on the larger donors. But I think in focusing on the larger donors, we need to really ask ourselves seriously how much disclosure we need. Do we need more disclosure than we're really already getting if a group like, you know, again, the Sierra Club or the Chamber uh, runs an ad? Rick, you want to make a few responses? First, I do agree that we need to raise our disclosure thresholds and that there's not much to be learned and, uh, by uh, 
a $200 contribution or a $100 contribution, that there should be a zone for individuals of some, uh, of some informational privacy. But when it comes to the big money, I strongly disagree. First of all, hearing about an ad that's run by uh, Americans for Prosperity, you don't know who that group is, it's very hard to judge. Uh, uh, who's the money behind it? And I would like to know as a voter. So for example, in California, we had uh, an initiative on the ballot that was changing the rules for whether public utilities could compete with private utilities, an issue about which I had really no opinion or any knowledge. Uh, then I saw all of the ads in favor of the initiative, and it turns out that all of the ads in California, we have a disclosure, so the group was called Yes on 43, I think it was, a coalition paid for by Pacific Gas and Electric, which is the major utility in Northern California. That was all I needed to know. I was voting against it, because uh, this looked to me like it was uh, trying to prevent competition. Okay. Uh, PG&E outspent the, uh, the uh, uh, side, uh, on the other side, 43 to 1, and still lost. Voters can use this as a cue, a valuable cue. And also, I talked about the legislative skew and the problem of special interest deals going on because of people benefiting, elected officials, candidates benefiting from this money. We're not going to be able to find all of those if we don't know who's behind the group. And if it's a C4 who's not disclosing its donors, we're not going to know. We're not going to have journalists or others who are going to be able to look for those kind of deals. We need to have that information. 501c4s in the past did this kind of advertising occasionally, but we have a C change. You saw the exponential growth in this kind of uh, 501c4 advertising. We've never had groups where they were sham super PACs. They do everything a super PAC does, but they don't disclose because they claim that they don't have to disclose. I think some of these groups after the election are going to be in trouble with both the IRS and the Federal Election Commission. But that's after the election will be a cost of doing business. But disclosure serves three important purposes. It prevents corruption, provides voters with valuable information, and it helps to enforce other laws, like the ban on foreign money coming into our elections. How do we know that the C4 is not getting money from a foreign source? Well, we don't. Nobody's enforcing the law. If we don't have that information, how are we going to know? Rick, let me ask you a question. If, if you all have a question for either Rick or Brad, uh, this is going to be my last question, so go ahead and, and, and line up at the microphone if you like. But you know, political science research pretty clearly shows that the more money that you spend on an election, uh, the higher voter turnout is, the lower voter roll-off is. So in other words, people who turn out to vote, uh, they're less likely to skip down ballot races. Uh, and maybe most importantly, voters are more informed the more money you have spent on elections. So, so what, what's wrong? Maybe we should have more money spent on the election. How would, how would you respond to something like that? Yeah, I've never been one of those people, and there are some, uh, who say too much money is spent on elections. And the retort that usually comes from Brad's side is we spend more selling potato chips than we do on elections. I don't have a problem with the total amounts of money. I have a problem with how we fund our elections. So if we had something back, I proposed in the 1990s, I said give every voter in the country a $100 voucher and use that to fund elections. You can't spend the money, you couldn't sell those. But you could donate them to candidates or to political parties or to interest groups, you know, give it to the NRA or to the NAACP or wherever you want. Let's have more money in elections, but if, first of all, if everyone had small amounts of money, we wouldn't have the problem of corruption, because we wouldn't have someone giving 20 million, 50 million, 100 million dollars like we potentially have now. And we, uh, we wouldn't have, uh, uh, we would have more, I think, a more equal playing field. So we'd solve both the uh, potential for corruption problem, we'd have greater equality, and I don't think we'd have a skew. How would, how would uh, legislators skew their views? They would skew them towards what the majority of people want, which I would call democracy. So I think that would be a, a, uh, a good development. Uh, spending money on elections can do good things, and I, you know, I believe in having generous contribution limits. I think that PACs, uh, corporate PACs, would be able to participate in elections. There are things that we can do, but we don't have to um, have unlimited. We don't have to say that, you know, I may be as intensely interested in politics as Sheldon Adelson, but I don't have 20 or 40 or 60 million dollars to spare on the election, and I, I don't think in our society we need to say that our elections are going to be, uh, the influence you have over the election is going to go to the highest bidder. Brad, how would you respond? Well, a number of points. First, 
you know, the skewing here is hypothetical. That is, we don't really see it really. Both sides are very well funded. And if you think back, you know, I usually find that it's people on the political left who are more concerned that money's going to skew priorities. So let's, let's take it from their perspective. Back before you had the Federal Election Campaign Act that put all these limits into place, you got Medicare and Medicaid and the Voting Rights Act and Social Security and all those things now that are viewed as pillars of the modern sort of American welfare state that the Democratic Party is you know, heavily devoted to protecting. So, I, you know, and, and I think, again, you see in these elections, money is, is covers the field quite well. Rick says, well, I don't have, I may be just, just as interested as Sheldon uh, but I don't have that kind of money. Well, there's other people who are just as interested in politics as Rick is, but they lack his skills. They don't have a job that gives them the time to write about politics. They don't have the skills to uh, file amicus briefs in important cases or represent clients in important cases or to write books. They don't have the time to do it. They're running maybe a business, a floral shop or something like that. And the government comes in and starts interfering and they think that's wrong and they want to spend some of their money I think that's a pretty good thing to do. I don't know why those of us in the sort of educated class should have influence that others are not allowed to get. Um, and that takes us to the whole problem here. We can say we're going to give everybody vouchers. That's fine. That still doesn't say, what are you going to do about Sheldon Adelson? Are you going to tell Sheldon Adelson he can't spend his money? Or are you going to tell somebody who wants to spend $5,000 or $1,000 they can't spend their money? And so you're still talking about blanketing the country with the sort of uh, a, you know, a, a speech police that's going to have to operate to decide when people are talking about elections and when they're just talking about taxes are too damn high or whatever it is they want to talk about. Uh, the rent is too damn high, right? And we're going to have to still deal with that problem. You're not going to have done away with it at all unless you set up this vast policing apparatus again, which is what we don't want. And I also question the view that Rick's reflected in his voucher proposal and also noted in, in the quote he put up from Austin, the idea that the amount of speech in a campaign should reflect what people thought before the campaign began seems very, very odd to me. Uh, most of the time we know, for example, that, that if Republicans win this fall, fundraising for Democratic groups will go up. And if Obama wins re-election, fundraising for Republican groups will continue to go up. People give money when they feel threatened. They give more money, and they give more money for different reasons, different times. But again, if you've got a, 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 something new, you've got to spend money to get your message out there. Suppose you've got the greatest idea in the world for a new, we'll make it just a, a vitamin that if you take it, you can live to be 100 guaranteed with no ailment, right? You got it. But you've got to convince people of that when nobody's ever heard of it. How are you going to do that if you can't spend money? If we say, well, the market for vitamins has to represent what people are already spending on vitamins, and they're not spending anything on your vitamin pal, right? That's not going to be a workable system. You need the flexibility of people to get in and out of the system and to put money in. I'll just give you one example. The last election before the Federal Election Campaign Act was 1968. Some of you may remember Gene McCarthy. He goes out. He declares his candidacy in December of 1967. Can you believe that? Be out declaring your candidacy in December of 2011. Nowadays, they've been campaigning for two years by then. He declares his candidacy in December of 1967, and within a week, he's got millions of dollars in the bank, not because a bunch of hardworking young people scrape together their pennies and nickels, no, because millionaires on Wall Street, a handful of millionaires, each contributed a million dollars directly to his campaign and got him up and running in no time, and he was able to knock Lyndon Johnson out of the race. I don't know if it was good or bad that he knocked Lyndon Johnson out of the race. I know that it would be bad if we lived in a society where a candidate would not have been able to knock Lyndon Johnson out of the race. And I think that would have been the case under the current campaign finance laws because nobody would have been able to raise enough money fast enough by the time it became apparent that the American people were losing confidence in Lyndon Johnson. So I would look at the issue very differently. Great, thank you very much. I have plenty of other questions. I can ask these guys questions all night, but I want to open up to the, to the audience. We have somebody uh, standing there. It's very difficult for us to see, so uh, go ahead with your question, please. Hi, I'm Lindsay Calhoun. I teach in the Communication Studies Department. Um, so I guess I, I'm, I'm confused um, by some of Brad's statements, because on the one hand, um, he's saying, well, what's wrong with the last 30 years of elections? And we've always been spending money, so um, why do people assume that things should be any different now with the, with the change? But then on the other hand, 
um, there seems to be this argument that if we have regulations, that that's somehow going to make things much worse and nobody's gonna have any free speech and elections are gonna be unfair and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, then my question to you, Brad, is first and foremost, um, why was the previous system that was essentially dismantled by the Supreme Court, why was that so bad? Because you yourself said that it wasn't that bad. And then secondly, um, when I you know, think about the last 30 years, I think about President Eisenhower making the statement in his speech that the relationship between the private sector industry and the government is getting too close. And so when you say to us, well, people just don't want um, corporations to speak because they just don't like what they have to say. And I'm like, that's not my, my concern at all. My concern is not at all with what they have to say. My concern is whether they get to decide policy. So, um, and for me, I'm sorry, but even the most, um, you know, moral people are going to have a really hard time um, trying to make decisions uh, in, in uh, legislatures of their um, own moral conscience when they know they're gonna be demonized in the press and called immoral and have their families harassed and you know and all of this kind of stuff. You can't resist that. You can't resist $40 million at coming at you. Um, no person should be even expected to. So like I said, it's to me the question I think that people on the left are asking is, in the last 30 years, what we've seen is the relationship between corporations and the private sector and government getting so close that there doesn't seem to be any separation. It's a revolving door. And the, the efforts that Campaign Finance was just to try to provide a few minor barriers. Were they so bad? Um, and why did we have to dismantle them? Okay. First, I think we have a mistaken premise here because obviously I didn't make myself clear. This is the case. I argue that elections have been worse over the last 40 years since we started this heavy regulation scheme in the 1970s. It has made elections worse. Remember, we've had only two regulation elections, well, one actually, under the deregulated system. That's 2010, and this is the second one. And I don't think that these elections have been in any way worse than the elections that came before. In fact, I think they've been better in many ways. I think we're getting higher turnout, more issue-oriented campaigns. I think we're getting challengers are doing better. You know, you look at 2010, the playing field kept expanding. Now, granted, that was due to unique circumstances, but on the other hand, people could get money into these campaigns. Uh, you know, Democratic lawyers uh, said all the time in 2006 and 2008, I would hear it all the time, that if they could have only gotten more money into campaigns, they could have expanded the playing field in 2006 and 2008, even when they made a lot of gains as it was. You know, the, the more money is expanding the playing field, making more things competitive, it is equalizing challengers and incumbents, not spreading the difference. And you know, back before we had all this regulation, back in the 50s, 60s, right, the typical incumbent outspent a challenger in a house race by about one and a half to one. Since the 1970s, when we started regulating all this, that spending advantage went up to about four to one, and that is now being equalized again. So I think the time frames I obviously wasn't clear on. Remember, in many ways, our elections are still more heavily regulated than at any time in history in certain ways. And certainly, I think the overall picture is that our regulations remain more heavily regulated than they did at any time prior to the 1970s. I also point out that states which have not engaged in this kind of heavy regulation have done quite well vis-a-vis -vis states that have not, or states that have not engaged in this kind of regulation have done quite well vis-a-vis -vis states that have engaged in this kind of regulation. So I think that if we look at the campaigns, I think the, the you know, the just sort of gut level sense we all have, I mean, it's hard to measure as a campaign good or bad, but I think it's definitely been an improvement. In terms of the closeness, right, I mean, the closeness again, my gosh, I mean, is there any sign that this has gotten better since we put all these regulations in place? I, I don't think there is. Um, and in fact, I think again, in many ways, it has gotten much worse because it's harder to shake up the system. It's harder for somebody to come in and shake up the system. And what you need to realize is that big corporations spend far more money lobbying than they spend on campaign spending. They don't want to spend money on campaigns. They want to spend it lobbying because that they can do much more easily behind the scenes. They don't influence their customers and so on. So I think that's the real source of this problem. I mean, I actually share much of your concern about what, you know, everybody says it on the right nowadays, crony capitalism, right? 
I think we have a very different view of what has led to that crony capitalism, and I think that's very important to, to, uh, to keep in mind. I, I just, uh, so, I, you know, when I would look at it there, I would just say, look at the results. Do we have good results from 40 years versus what we had all of the, the years before? And I'll raise one final point. You know, when you say 40 million, that's a lot of money, but there's a lot of money on both sides in politics. The races get pretty well funded. If, if you can almost always find money on one side or the other. If you're a good candidate, you can tell a donor to take a hike and there will be donors who will rush in from the other side to fill the void, that's my guy. And I want to contest something Rick said that people often bring to this. People don't give money for nothing, they expect something. B.S. they do. Most of them expect good public policy, that's what they want. They want good public policy. You know, we have students in the audience, and some of you, your education's being paid for by people you've never met, you've never heard of, they've given you the money that goes to scholarships. What do they want from you? But they gave you something for nothing. What kind of paucity of, of sort of the human heart does it have to say people never give money unless they want something in return? We do that all the time in our society. And by the way, if that's how we really view politics, then there's another question. Why do people vote unless they want something from the government? And if that's the case, we can pretty much do away with the whole idea of civic virtue to begin with. Every voter is just a mercenary trying to get all he can from the government. Right? And, and once we're there, well, yeah, I'm not sure there's any point in having a democracy anymore. Then, then you've just got who can ever get the most votes to loot their fellow citizens wins. Right? And that doesn't strike me as good. Our democracy relies on the idea that people don't always do things simply because they want some tangible benefit in return. Okay. I'm not going to respond. I'll, I'll wait till it comes up in the next All right. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening and thank you for coming. I have a question for Brad and Rick. Let me start with uh, Rick. You said that uh, it's okay to spend money on campaign and election, but there should be a limit. So my question is, what do you think is a reasonable amount to spend on the campaign and how does the government set that limit? For, for Brad, I wanna take an example, you know, like uh, right now, the Cook brothers, you know, the two people can really outspend an entire nation. So it's for example, you know, they are spending money for Romney. Romney get elected, of course, he's going to rubber stamp those two, those two people policies. It seems to me that it's going to lead to the weakening of democracy and create the, the rising of an oligarchy. Don't you believe so? about uh, spending limits. Um, I'm not talking about campaign spending limits. So I think campaigns should be able to spend uh, money that they raise. And if they raise more money, they can spend more money. In my ideal system, we would use these vouchers, which would allow for ample funding. And then for people who wanted to spend outside of that, I would, uh, certainly for corporations and probably for individuals, I would want to impose a, a high limit, but a, a reasonable limit. Uh, right now, we have a limit on how much you can contribute to all federal campaigns in a two-year cycle, which I think is $117,500. That limit doesn't apply to super PACs or anything like that. That sounds like a, a, a reasonable amount, uh, you know, that I think you can get your message out. And, and so now let me come back to something uh, that Brad said about how uh, I may not have money, but I have uh, uh, influence in other ways because I can speak and, and write amicus briefs. Well, for every Rick Hassan, there's a Brad Smith. We're kind of um, evenly distributed along the political spectrum. But when it comes to money, money skews in a particular way. Money always skews towards the interest of the wealthy. And uh, politics, uh, if it skews towards the interest of the wealthy, I think that is very troubling for the reasons uh, that we've spoken about. And that's why I would impose those kinds of spending limits. Uh, on I, uh, I would do it on individuals as well as corporations, but we're so far from that, I would like to start at least going back to where we were a few years ago, which is that corporations, if they want to influence the outcome of elections, they should do so through political action committees where they can pay the administrative expenses, then go to their executives and go to their shareholders and say, give us up to $5,000 each, we'll pool the money together, we'll get out our message about the world's greatest vitamin, there'll be plenty of money coming in, I'm not concerned about that. We'll get our message out, and if it's a good message, other people will join us. Um, yeah. Uh, first, I, I want to uh, make uh, 
one quick point. Well, let, let's go right to the question. So, so the coach can get a lot of money, and this will raise it. Rick says, well, money is skewed toward the wealthy. What a crock. Holy cow. I mean, money is much more evenly spread, right? We look at big Hollywood. We look at big journalism. We look at academia, right? All of these areas, which are the opinion leaders, right, are skewed heavily toward the left side of the American political spectrum. Money is much more evenly spread. If you look at most elections, both parties raise large sums of money. The Democrats outrage the Republicans by substantial amounts in 2008 and in 2010 and in 2006. And, you know, I mean, we might say, well, maybe the Democrats are a money party now, but I think most people still view them as the non-money party. In fact, historically, Again, if you want to look at the, the actual effect of money, notice that the Republicans did very well under a system that limited contributions and, and did not have super PACs as an option. The Republicans did very well under that. Why? Because the Republican Party is a party of what we might call the middle class and the upper middle class. That's where it draws most of its support. And these are people who can afford to give $500 or $1,000 and they're articulate and they pay attention to politics and they do very well. The Democratic Party, to the extent that it tends to represent poorer people, right, relies more heavily then on its millionaires to offset that fundraising ability. The poor people don't have money to spend on politics and campaigns and, and, and very frankly, they often are less inclined to know how to do it, right? Because they don't get the education and the attention. Now this, in a sense, plays into answering, and, and you know, there's a zillion examples, the Pritzkers and Soros and uh, Steve Bing and, you know, all these dot-com millionaires and Warren Buffett, and I, mean, I mean, it's just money skews toward the rich. I, you know, dem people, high-income people, if you look at voting trends, right, you start low income people vote Democratic. Democratic voting share drops with income until you get up to really high incomes and then the Democratic voting share goes zooming back up over 50%. So that's just not true. And that takes us to this question, yeah, the Kochs have a lot of money, but in the end that money is not stuffed into ballot boxes, it is used to try to persuade people how to vote. And there will be folks on the other side trying to persuade you how to vote. And in the end, you know, if, if we don't believe that we can make those decisions, then we've got problems that go way beyond money in politics. Now, you know, I have to say, I, you, know, you know, just as Rick says, well, he wouldn't mind a high limit. He won't say what it is. I also wouldn't be terribly upset if we had a high limit. People say, well, should you have any limit? I say, no, but, but you know, look, this wouldn't have been the last 20 years of my life if we had a, a legitimately reasonably high limit and not the, not the relatively low limits we've had. So, you know, you look at the coach, you look at Sheldon Adelson, you know, his candidate in the primaries lost. Uh, his candidate in the general election is probably going to lose. You know, I wouldn't worry that much about it. I think both sides will be well funded and, and the voices will get out. And you want as many people to play the game as possible. You want as many views as possible to be heard. And, and a deregulated system allows that. We probably have time for two more questions. My name is Stephen Halleck, sir. I'm a retired professor of history. I have a blog called Digital, Digital Governing. It's a Tumblr blog. I'm very interested in the impact of uh, digital media on politics and governance, uh, not only in the U.S., but worldwide. And what I'd like to ask all of you is, uh, given the fact that there is a widespread spread perception that uh, our government and our policies are dictated by a relatively small number of people or institutions with large amounts of money, whether that's true or not, that perception is very widespread, and indeed, the lack of popularity of Congress is one example of that. Congress is widely mistrusted. Um, what do you see as the potential for um, organizing through digital media, for example, Facebook, as a way of, in effect, outflanking the present system? There are many apps, one of them being Votizen, where you can use the power of the open graph to discover which of your friends share your political views and then work with them to help elected, elect like-minded candidates. Uh, it has so far 1.5 million voters uh, have connected and there's 5,000 candidates in the system. That's one example, only one. There are many, many others where people are organizing using digital media on the margins of political parties and the structures that are now in place. 
We've also seen, of course, the uh, ability of people to organize during the Arab Spring um, on uh, digital media, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. What do you think about this whole issue of um, digital media as a uh, maybe even a threat or a counterweight to the current system? Uh, one thing I had expected to be seeing by now is uh, that uh, television advertising would become less important because I had expected that um, social media, the great leveler, easier to spread things around without great expenses. But we have, it hasn't uh, materialized yet. Uh, and the campaigns are still, they're finding, uh, they're raising hundreds of millions of dollars and they're finding things to spend it on. Uh, the, what they call the burn rate. Uh, I think uh, the Obama campaign is, uh, and maybe the Romney campaign too, are, is spending more money than it's taking in. Uh, so well, there may be some leveling and some evening in the digital area, but money still is incredibly important uh, for these campaigns. And um, uh, you know, the series of desperate emails that the Obama campaign was sending out over the last few months uh, indicates that they certainly uh, are not relying on a, a digital media strategy as, a, as the primary way of getting their people to register and vote. So I'll say very quickly, uh, I, I agree with much of what you've said, uh, you know, and I think it ha can change things a lot, and I think it has changed a lot, and has helped to, to increase the role of small donors. One reason that, that I'm loath to have a big regulatory apparatus here is because, as in most fields, it chokes off innovation. You know, the FEC, when the internet first came up, you know, insisted, as government agencies tend to do, on treating it just like they used to treat tr print media and so on. And the reform community did. The reform community fought tooth and nail. They took the FEC to court when we passed a regulation that made clear that we were not going to heavily regulate the internet. They called it a loophole and they, all other kinds of things that they referred to the internet as the new path for corruption and so on. Uh, and so you start to think about all that. They, they opposed. Uh, when we let people text uh, political messages and political fundraising appeals and so on. Uh, there's a tendency of, of that stasis of regulation that I think would have killed some of the, the digital revolution that has taken place. And politics is a very fast moving game. Uh, so it's, it to me is another reason why, uh, again, we don't want a heavy government pre presence in this area. Question for both of you about 501c4s. In the past, 501c4s, such as the Sierra Club, which Professor Smith cited, have existed for social purposes and run some ads on the side. Groups such as Crossroads seem to exist to run ads. My question is, are they doing anything else? And if they aren't, could they be in legal trouble down the road? There are two issues. Uh, with the C4s. And I should point out, Crossroads is a super PAC. It's the sister uh, organization, GPS, that's the C4. There are uncertainties uh, under both tax law, which is not my area, and uh, federal election law as to whether or not groups like GPS are breaking the law. In order to uh, uh, be a count as a social welfare organization as a C4, you can't have uh, politics uh, being your primary purpose, has to be a social welfare purpose. So what does it mean in terms of primary purpose? Sounds like maybe we're not sure from the IRS that they have to spend at least 50% of their uh, money on things other than election ads. But those could be issue ads. And so they could be political groups. And we're, maybe we'll get some clarity from the IRS uh, after this election. I don't think we'll get any clarity before this election. I think if the IRS tried to do anything now, it would be seen as them interfering in the election. They, kind of took some steps in that direction, then backed off. In terms of the Federal Election uh, Campaign Act, a group that has as its major purpose, the election or defeat of federal candidates, uh, must register as a political committee. And so there have already been some complaints filed, I think, against GPS and against other organizations claiming that they are um, uh, violating the FEC rules by not registering. And the main consequence, if they registered, is we'd have better disclosure. Uh, I think uh, it's potentially uh, possible that by 2014, 15, we get some clarity here. Just like in 2004, we had these 527s that were acting like super PACs when it wasn't legal to be a super PAC. And 
They ended up getting fined, big fines, like um, it was a Democratic-leaning group which had uh, big Soros contributions called Americans Coming Together. It was a six-figure fine. But it was two years after the election. The group was defunct. And if they're fine, it's the cost of doing business. And they'll form a new group with a new name. So maybe we'll have better uh, disclosure in 2016 because it'll become clearer by then what C4s are allowed to do or not allowed to do. Yeah, I, I would just add, I, you know, I don't know if there's any evidence that any of these groups are doing anything illegal, right? And that would be the issue. And the tax issue and the FEC issue are related because if they spend most of their time doing political activity, then they're not a 501c4 issue for tax purposes. Therefore, they're violating their IRS status and they're not, then they are a political committee for FEC status. Um, I think that that is something that is, is relatively easy to handle. You know, in other words, I'm not, I'm not wedded to, you know, having C4s engage in political activity. Uh, the IRS, or perhaps it's Congress that would need to act, could reduce the amount of activity that C4 organizations could spend on politics. Like you say, historically, C4s have an interest in politics. Very often, policies are important to them, but that's not their primary thing. That's, you know, it's kind of a side thing. And, and the IRS has never really defined what that means. Most people think it's 50% because they use the term major purpose, but, but nobody really knows. And the IRS could, you know, through regulation, I think, make something clear. I think, as Rick says, that you wouldn't want to do it in the middle of a campaign. So I, I think you can do that. But I think the way to approach that, you know, to the extent that that's the concern, and you want to force that money into super PACs where it is subject to disclosure, then the trick to do that is to simply make clear what the tax rules are going to be, and that allows your traditional, what we might call traditional C4s, like the NAACP, the Sierra Club, you know, the Rifle Association, your traditional C6s, like the Realtors and things like that, to uh, continue on to, to function as they have while forcing a lot of the more seemingly political groups into the, uh, you know, super PAC realm, if that's really what they're doing. I should add that uh, Congress has been considering some legislation to do this, but so far it's been supported only by Democrats and blocked by Republicans. And so something uh, that we're seeing is that there really is a strong par party divide now, not only on issues about limits, which has been around for a while, but also on the questions of uh, enhancing disclosure. I, 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 just don't, I, I think you're mistaken, Rick. The Disclose Act does not address that tax status, and it does not address major purpose status. It simply tries to make C4s disclose more of their donors, and that raises the whole NAACP issue and so on. I don't think they go to the tax status, so I don't think that's what's trying to happen there. Well, uh, we, we'll have to uh, end disagreeing the way we began. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd like to thank you both very much for an insightful and engaging discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for, for joining us tonight, and I'd like to remind you that our next uh, lecture in the Presidential Speaker Series is Tuesday, October 9th. Uh, Mark Stencil, who's the managing editor, uh, digital editor for NPR News, will be our guest. That will be at 7 p.m. over in the Barcelona Alumni uh, and Visitor Center. So thank you very much, and have a good night. Thank you.